Hi there. Well, there's a train passing. I'm just on the outskirts of Siberia back there. You might be able to see an oncoming train. Can you see some dim lights back there? Maybe, just maybe. There's a train just passing. And another one just coming. See a little red light there from the edge of the train. I'm on the bank here. It leads down. This is the very edge of Siberia ghost town. And um, this is the this is the edge. Not the edge of deep water, but the edge. I'm striking out there into the into the darkness. Let's go. On the train. show you something that I found over here. I found this the last time I came through here. The second to last time. I'm walking back towards it. I found it coming the other way. There's this pile of stones here. Some of the stones are very curious. I don't know exactly what it is. Look at this. Isn't that interesting? It's very porous. I just don't see other stones like that here. And there's lots of them. Same type of porous stone. That one's interesting. Hmm. But there's a wooden structure here. A tin roof. It almost looks like the entrance of a mine, but it can't be. It's too shallow, too small. But there's bits of wood. It's not far, maybe a half mile from the railroad. You can hear a train going by right now. You can kind of see inside. Someone took time to position the, the wood. The train's going by Siberia Ghost Town out there. A little roof there. It doesn't seem to go back very far. And over here, just uh, what this is doing here. I was looking at these further stones and I found, where is it? Right over there. There's a hinge. That's strange, look at that. Okay. I didn't want to pick it up, but I was curious to see what it was. It's an old hinge, you can see the springs in it. See the springs? Put it back the way I found it. Anyway. There's the second train coming across. Three more blasts. Short, long. It's getting that strange sound because it was blasting through the other train. The sound. Anyway, it gives you an idea about how far the railroad is. Curious. Okay, onward. Me. Such light. It's really a shame to turn it on. It's so dark here. That's better. All alone in 200 square miles of desert. And I can see it all. In darkness, at least. The outlines of the mountains in the distance across the way. 
volcanoes to the left, more mountains and hills to the right, and an immediacy all around. Walking through a desert at night without a flashlight. Every step is feeling like Brea. Well, I can see a little bit. It's not enough to feel like I have clarity fool myself into thinking I have clarity. I know I don't, and that's good. I wish I could always feel that way. I wish I could always be so informed. I see a dark lump ahead. A mountain, a dead volcano. That's where I'm at. That's the direction I'm going. It's not my destiny. Not my destination. What's this? I've come to a gully of some sort. You can't see it. I won't turn on the light. Although, this is a place where there might be snakes. I'm walking among some uh, sage plants now. I'm gonna step down into the sandy part. Maybe you can hear how my footsteps will change. Now I'm walking in the sand. This is where the snakes might be. Hunting along the perimeter. So I won't stay here. Carefully I'll get back up on the rocks. Back, back on course towards the uh, black dead volcano. As, as, as I walk, it only incrementally gets larger, looms slowly. What would I expect? I'm not all alone yet. I can hear the train. It's taking a long time. Maybe you can see it. That's it. Moving slowly across the desert, up the uh, Mojave Grade. It'll blow its horn in a while, and then it'll be gone. I'll keep on moving through the desert. Okay, rocky here. Big rock right there. Stepping on it. Solid. Okay, let's. Let's see if I can measure my steps a little bit. Up until now, my steps have been rather hasty. Let's slow down, Kurt. Let's see if I can get these steps more measured before the train whistle blows. Ah, that's it. That's a way to live. That's a way to walk. That's a way to move. That's a way to be. Keep it up. Keep it up all night. That's what she said. Just because I'm serious doesn't mean I don't have to be funny. Live life. Have fun. Walk steady. As far into the night as I can. Until the whistle blows. Then I'll stop the camera.
thinking about. That's most stoic. Night hiking. And I realize it's the deliberate nature of my steps. There's a cliff right there. I don't know if you can see. Not really a cliff, but under the circumstances. What I have within my control is not this desert, but these steps. I have a pale luminosity, a pale there's a light around me I can see. And when the light's off, I can still see a little bit. Even better in fact, the moonlight. Well now there's a cliff-like thing on the right. I'm dead ahead. It really is like a cliff. That wouldn't be good to go forward. I'd slip and fall for sure. I'm not in control of the fact that everywhere about me now, there's a little cliff. Except I perceive over here to the left, maybe a way out. What do I control? My footsteps. So let me find way that way. You can't see him now, but you can hear him. Each footstep is a deliberate action. A calculated motion. I'm not being random, and frantic, and frenetic, which will cause me to trip and fall. Instead, I'm being careful. I'm calculating. I'm deliberate. And also resign to the fact of the greater desert around me. The fact that there's nothing I can do about that. But carefully choose my steps. Now of course the analogy I'm drawing is that so too in life. Not much I can do about the world. a cairn. Is that a cairn? There's not much I can do about the world. All I can do is about my footsteps. Now there's something right in front of me. It's kind of spooky. What is this? A pile of rocks? I'm going to turn the light on. Exactly what that is. It's a cairn directed here by someone else sometime in the past. What the heck? Way out here. Why? Is there a thing in it? Mining thing maybe? Sometimes these little rock piles have a mine claim inside. I don't see anything. Directed for a reason. It's a mystery. I have no idea. <laughs> that too is in fact already beyond my control. What's that? Oh wait. There is a note. Look at that. It's, this is a mining claim. You can read it there. Let's take a look. I'm going to take my backpack off. So the miners would put these out here. Like this. So this is right here against the rock. You can see there's the lid. It's still nicely sealed. And there's the rocks over there. So it was probably once associated with that. Maybe the wind blew it over here against this rock. That's fascinating. Let's take a kind of a closer look. You see that? There's writing on it. 
by the hell out here in the middle of the desert. <laughs> Literally, I've just been wandering in. Not quite aimlessly. I, I know the general direction that I'm going. I, but let's see if we can uh, set up the camera and take a minute. We can uh, have a look, see at this together in a way that makes sense. Uh, without damaging it too much. This would be the second such claim that I've ever found. Hi. Here we go. Let's pick it up. There's something in there. A rock, maybe? It looks like it's in pretty bad shape. Boundaries, something work, claim as required. Yeah, this is a mining claim. This is claim. Here, let's see if I can set up light in such a way that this will work. Let's go ahead and unscrew it. knows how long it's been. See all the dust coming off? Where's all this dust coming from? I do want to do this. Yeah, it'll probably just start falling apart as soon as I start pulling it out. Yeah, kind of. It's literally just coming to pieces. Let's see what that was in there. There's a rock or something. There's something in there. Not quite like a rock. When I, when I dump this, it's going to dump all kinds of shards out. That's dust from it. Now there, that's not, that's more than just a rock. That's, look at that. It's very shiny and glassy. See that? So that's more than just a, it's, it's kind of a mystery. Look at that. I hope, it's, I hope that focus is focusing. It's very glassy. Where's my other? I got a smaller light. Maybe the smaller light will do a better job than this big light. This little pen light I've got right here instead. Let's see if that'll do a better job. Just, just not quite focusing, is it? back there. See how it's kind of glassy? This is what was rattling around in there. So let's take a better look. I'm gonna try to turn that on to illuminate a little better. Let's see if we can read this at all. I'll put that little glassy thing right there. Okay. Oh man, this thing's just, it's just, it's just literally falling apart. The paper's just coming apart everywhere. And Okay. Let's see. It's, it's like trying to read old script of some sort. I mean, in terms of it's just pieces. Within 90 days after the date of location, and I can't see the list, locators thereof shall sink a discovery shaft Something is part of the rim of the shaft at the surface, or shall drive below the surface. Locators of an association claim something, something open cut of 20 acres containing in the associate. See, it's, let me see if I can show you. It's, it's cut off. Yeah. You can see the writing there. Hopefully that's helping a little bit, maybe from the back of it. See, but it's, it's, it's really hard. It cuts off. I don't see, like that other mining claim actually had written, I see the number nine written here. What's this? More. Public Resources Code 1967, 20-acre placer claim. Uh, I don't know. There's, there's really nothing that makes any and it's just, look at this, it's just crumbling to dust, the paper is. I'm going to put this back. Let's put 
this paper back in best that we can. But it's, I should have kind of, actually, there's still time I can do this right. Uh, I'm not going to do a good job. I'm going to stuff it in there the uh, best I can. And I'm going to take this little glass piece too, which is really quite interesting. Wow. Drop it back in too. Gosh, only knows how long this has been sitting here. I'll put it back just the way I found it. The last one I found was from the 30s. So it's an old mine. Old mining claim, at least. Oh, there's the moon behind me. See it up there? There it is. Thanks for joining me out here in the desert. <laughs> Turn this light off. <sighs> and as for those other thoughts, yeah, I'll keep digesting those. Take care. That's where the real treasure is. <laughs> That's this. I've come upon another desert rock cairn. All of a sudden, just out here, well, I was walking without the flashlight, just under the moonlight. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you can see it, there's a hulk of a mountain over there that I'm walking towards. So my eyes are adjusted, and I stopped for a second, looked up, and there's this looming rock cairn. I know what these are. This is an old desert mining claim. Last one I found, which is about 30 minutes ago, had a uh, actual claim, a little jar with the mining claim on it. Let's see if this can find it, if this has anything. So, some miner found something here, probably a, what they call a placer claim, or placer claim, you know, surface deposit. So there's something here on, on the surface that got the miner's attention. You can see that the this is clearly, I wonder how these, where these pieces of wood came from. There's no trees like this anywhere around here. Where in the world could that have come from? How hard did that wash down? Anyway, let's take a look at this. Now watch out for snakes. So I think a pack, pack rat has been hanging around in here. You can see all the debris. last one, the jar wasn't near the uh, cairn, it was somewhere above. Let's check the cairn carefully. Sometimes they put it inside the rocks. That seems like it would have been a great place for it right there. Stuff down there. Nothing. Or maybe someone already came and found it. Here, around here somewhere. Let's get a close look. Nothing. But no. Glass jars are sometimes they're in metal tins. The, the metal tins especially look a lot like what's that? Look like these rocks. Which is a nice rounded rock. Well imagine that uh, if, if I am actually in the wash, flash floods could have washed it away, but I imagine they would have taken away the knock over the cairn if that was the case. What's that rock there? Nope, just a white rock. A famous white rock. <laughs> okay, no luck. Just a can, but no can. Okay, carrying on. Off of the light. One last look. Anything else? And we're way far away. Several miles from nearest road and there's no trail I'm just wandering wandering through the desert
And back we go. Time to get my uh, whoa, eyes adjust. Take care. My mind is playing tricks on me. I'm in the uh, Siberia wash. Uh, you can hear my footsteps. I'm trying to slow them down. My hip footsteps are moving quickly. A measure of my anxiety. I think I'm far enough now that any trains that go by Siberia will only be a dim echo. I'm over the ridge. I can hear a plane going overhead right now. Jet far above. But I'm in the wash. And there's these large plants. Can't quite rem remember what it's called. Almost remember. There's one right there. And the thing is, these stalks, they're all over the place. There's, there's another big one right there. Let's get closer. As I approach, the stocky part in the middle looks like a figure standing there. Because it's a darker shadow. It's a darker dark. I should come into focus. There. This center stocky part looks like someone's standing there. And it's getting me over and over as I go along. Because the flashlight's off. And I just see these, there's another one right up there. You see it, and it looks like there's someone standing by the tree. <laughs> there's another one. So, I don't know if it's worse with the light on or off. And there's a whole bunch of these things. There's a rock wall. In. I think I know where I am now. And see, I just thought I was going to move. It's kind of freaking me out. And it turned off. So my anxiety ri rises and my footfall changes. Let's see if I can get my footsteps measured again. Here's the rock wall. Let's take a look. This is where I have to watch out. This is where the snakes like to uh, hunt right along the edge there, looking for rodents. I see their tracks in the daylight, you know, the snake trails. Here's the rock wall. I think I know where I am. Pretty sure. Off the rock. Okay. Slow the footsteps down, Kurt. With a little luck. I'll be in Campo number one, not too long. My goal is to push past that, maybe as far as the cold gate. Although the thought of overnighting there, in that new strange place, kind of sends further chills down my spine. Okay, slow the footsteps, Kurt. Slow, measured pace. Do better. <laughs> such is the, such is the challenge of life, is it not? I'm almost at camp on number one. The rhyolite height is right over there. I can see the outline of the structure. I've spent two nights here in the past. Something about that familiarity that makes you feel good. You can just make out the structure right there. Structure of the old. Be a little clearer when I get closer. There's a perimeter of rocks around it. I 
don't think I'll stay here tonight. I'm just gonna have to stop by. Here's the perimeter of rocks, the cairns. There's several of these. Kind of mark the periphery and the edge. I've never taken a close look to see if there's any cans. I don't think so. There's more rocks. But the structure's right there. There's another pile of rocks. And still more over there. Like a hut, remnants of it. If I open the light up a little more, that didn't help. The table, old chair, and what might be the remnants of a burn, you know, like a stove or something. And there's a bottle over here with some fluid in it too. So good. And the sign that says Campo Number One. There's the table, there's the chair, here's the sunken beam structure sign up there, and the beam, here's the sign, Campo number one, the chair and the table, I still hear a train in the distance. Here's the, uh, that's a rock burning in it. burner, some sort, table, I don't know this is, this is 1979 on it, more periphery up there, so it's interesting, I haven't seen that before, that line, interesting. anxiety right now. Just fatigue. I'm tired. I should probably stop here. But I'm going to carry on. But I have a long hike now through a quite dead wash. Quite, quite dead but quite alive. I really should stay the night here. But I'll carry on. Morning. What a comfortable night. <sighs> Slept really well. Hiked until uh, past midnight. And then I was able to uh, set, arrived here at uh, Campo Number One. This desert camp. Old deserted desert mining camp. And then I set up my uh, little camp here. Have a look. Here I am uh, in my Bivy. There's the remains of Campo Number One. And, uh, what a great night's sleep I had. Ready for the day? Let's do it. Here's my little camp from last night. Here at uh, Campo Number One in the desert. Black Mountain, and um, I used my uh, helium uh, bivy uh, oxygen research. I think it's called OR, and uh, really like this thing. I actually prefer it over my regular tent. Sun's coming up now. Very very comfortable. 
little uh, pad there on the ground. Uh, outdoor research, that's what it is. Outdoor research, helium, helium divvy. Um, I fit perfectly in there. Uh, it fits really nice in my pack. I need very little stuff. Um, I've got a, uh, 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 this is an REI pad on the bottom. So I have the ground cover and then the uh, bivy itself, which is really easy to assemble. Just one, one little uh, loop through there. Then the uh, inflatable pad and then my sleeping bag. And what's really nice is that this can put up like that. And then the, there's just a the little net Get that rock out of there. A little net that comes up if I want. Or if you want, you just let that drop down. Or you can seal it up. and be totally, when it's like that, totally enclosed within. You can zip it all up if you want. And it's such a, so comfortable. I, I Honestly, gosh, I think last night must have been uh, one of the uh, most comfortable <laughs> sleeps of my life. Uh, nights of my life sleeping. Really, really enjoyed it. I can't, I can't uh, speak highly enough of the uh, Outdoor Research, Research Helium Bevy. And it's not a paid endorsement, just a, a loving endorsement here from uh, this deserted desert mining camp. Camp on number one in the Mojave Desert. Okay, time to get up, put the uh, divvy away, and uh, head into those uh, low mountains up there. Let's go. I'm presently engaged in... And I'm uh, terming stoic walking, maybe stoic hiking. It's very simple. I began doing this last night. Maybe I'll call this the stoic hike. Deliberate first. Oop, that's not so good. Heard each step a little more careful. Step between the rocks. Step where the way is clear. I'm terming what I'm doing right now stoic walking or stoic hiking, which is the more deliberate and careful movement through the landscape. I started doing this last night as I did my night hike from Siberia Ghost Town, way down there in the desert, to El Campo where I stayed last night. Campo number one. And, uh, have I found it? So soon? Can, can this be the canyon? No, okay, so you know how as, as I start to get excited, my steps get hasty. Less excited, Kurt. Less hasty. No, that can't be the canyon I'm after. I think I came to, I turned, I cut across a little too soon. Or maybe it is. No, I don't know what that is. I don't know where that goes. It's not the one I'm after, though. Okay, back to it, Kurt. See, if I was. If I was stoic walking, stoic hiking, the excitement and confusion of this uh, little canyon here wouldn't have had that effect on me. I would have kept my steady pace, my deliberate pace, despite the fact that I was considering this or, or even that. Wow, what is that? I wonder where that goes. All, all stuff to explore. There's Black Mountain. So I'll get back to it. My stoic walking. Sometimes the landscape is going to slip out under me. Sometimes there's not much I can do but to uh, face a little bit like this. Small little cliff, in fact. No way to get down there without sliding. But as I walk, I've got to mine the stones. If I can just translate this into my living make my stoic walk a way of life so that I'm stepping through each day every hour 
every minute and every second even in this more deliberate and careful manner recognizing what is and what is not within my control then I think I will have achieved something worthwhile that will be a good thing and I, I certainly want to strive towards good things Very soon this uh, place will be denied me. I won't be able to come here anymore. I'll be too old, too uh, lame and crippled and scared. I'll think about it if I'm able, if, I'm a, <laughs> if, I'm a, if I make it to that old age. I'll remember this place, this moment right here. This place at the outer edge of exploration. But I won't be able to come here again. So I better uh, get out while I can. But not to get it over with, but to uh, get her done. See ya. That's the uh, edge of Coldgate. That long strip that runs along there. Tips down over there. That dip part is as far as I've ever made it. I'm up to wash. Made a false start. Campo number one is directly back there and then down to the left. That's the uh, that's deep water wilderness back there. This is beyond deep water. Truly beyond deep water once I go around that bend right there. Feeling good. I feel mature. Interesting feeling. Feel, uh, if maturity is anything about uh, not speaking less, there have been several times already where I would have turned the camera on in the past to speak, just to, just to maybe to hear myself speak, just to brush aside this emptiness, maybe also to, to share. But, more and more, I think that all the, all those past videos that I've ever made were really more about keeping myself company than anything else. I'm not a lonesome person or sad or lonely in any way. I, I relish the quiet and the peace, but still the uh, quiet and the peace are quite intimidating. That's one way I might get to Mount Wildness. Is to go up that way and then somehow through over the other side. But now I'm gonna go up into this valley up here. Have us a look-see. So the uh, camera stays off more and more. But the words still come. And I, I'm, I appreciate the way they come now. They, they come in written form now. And I think they're better than they were before. It's a good feeling. <laughs> 50, almost 56, I guess it's time to, time I start to mature a little bit. There's the cold gate. I'll turn the camera back on when we get there. Or maybe not. Welcome to well, really, this is the edge. That's beyond deep water up there. That's the deep water wilderness back there. This is the cold gate. It's a rhyolite dike that runs along this way. There's a break in the dike here where the waters go through and then continue. You can just imagine how many eons of flood have coursing through here. A little poop. Maybe. Last time I 
guys here, there were a pair of eagles that came soaring off that rock right there. That's where I'm headed up to. My destination for today isn't much further. Imagine this has all been carved out over, gosh, only knows how many tens of thousands of years. Why is that like that? Kind of like that bracca, the rocks, and then this stuff inside, holding it together. Okay, let's go. I think I can see the place I want to go. Up there. This would make a perfect spot for my little god, Daikoku. This little hole right here. Wow, it's perfect. God, despite my wife's wishes that I don't do it, I'm sorely tempted. Right here. At the edge of uh, the coal gate, at the edge of beyond deep water. Sorely tempted. He's an orphan god after all. He could use a good home. Look at those colored hills there. Here in beyond deep water. That'd be fun to explore. My destination now is just right up there. A little fear now. I usually feel some fear here. But it's uh, warm. Hot actually. It's always the heat that scares me. But it shouldn't get over 80 degrees. Ish. And there's some canyon up there. There might be some shade in there, which would be a nice thing, hard thing to find. Here it is. If you look at the cover of my book, Going Alone, on the lower right side of the front cover, there's an open area with a dot right in the middle. That's this dot. And that long, finger-like streak is that bit right there. First time for me to ever be here. First time at this spot. As far as I've been. It's everything I imagined it would be. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Is that a rock cairn? Sure does, huh? It's a miner assembled this. A mining claim? That surprised me. Why? No reason to be surprised. The rocks certainly like tumbled. I'll look around, but I don't see any uh, bottle or can. I have the claim information. That's the place. That's what I got to get through to get to Mount Wildness. Welcome to the good life. My name's Kurt. Precarious perch up here on this uh, rocky outcropping in the furthest point I've ever been in the desert. It's disconcerting to be this far out. The sun is uh, heating up. It shouldn't get above 80, but still, it's something to be worried about. It's easy for the worries to flood in in a place like this. You don't worry about mainly the responsibility that 
I have in life and the others who count on me, namely my wife and my daughter, and the need to take care of myself. Heaven forbid something happened to me. They'd be all right, but it would be a it'd be a rough going while they got into a new situation. And heaven forbid I, I survived that something and needed someone to care for me. That wouldn't be good. To these thoughts, pushing out to the edge, kind of come creeping back at me. Being a responsible person. I'm glad for that responsibility. I'm glad that's really what gives life its meaning is, is taking on some slice of responsibilities, some slices of responsibility and caring for them. It's like a potted garden to nurture and care for and leave something blooming in our wake. rather than just tending to our own bloom. Eh, that's fine too, but how much better to help a few other blooms along. So I'm going to try to do my good life now. I will do it. I'll just get that little preamble out of the way. And it's hard to move, although let me give it a try. <laughs> I'm barefoot on these sharp, pointy rocks. Barefoot and vulnerable. I've raised my voice out here. This is, oh. This is a place that I probably wouldn't want to usually raise my voice. Heaven forbid whatever is out here realizes I'm here. But I'm here. Echo. That's where I have to go to get to the deep water. I mean, um, Mount Wildness, my perennial destination, the place I've never made and probably never will. I gotta get through those mountains somehow. This hike was to reconnoiter, getting here. The next time I come here, I wanna come here by night, all the way. But I have to learn the landmarks, be able to distinguish them in the dark, in the moonlight, to get here. Hmm, maybe to camp. Over there. Not so sure. But let's do this. The Good Life Meditation for today. I think it's November 15th, 2019. The Good Life is my daily recitation of objectives and principles that I have formed, in some cases borrowed, in some cases stolen, eh, but in many cases fabricated my, on my own to uh, make sense of the world. Well, not to make sense of the world, but to make, to make a way. This rock here is split like a book open. To make, to give myself a road map forward. To make life worth living. I mean, sure, you can live it. We can live it just to live it. You know, have a lot of fun. But in the end, that's only so satisfying. And then not so much. <laughs> much better to, like I said before, to do something good in the time we're here. So here we go. The first objectives, first objective is the objective to be always ready to die. To have all my affairs in order. And I'm going to use the thing that I henceforth to date have not used. I'm going to use the three F's. <laughs> to have three, three things in order. My three F's, my uh, fortune, <laughs> ha, fortune, my family, and this is the reason I didn't use it. I didn't like, I couldn't find a better F, but fame, okay? So, but that's actually, I've been thinking about it for about a year. I think that's as good. So fortune, family, and fame have those three things in order. And the reason fortune comes first is that fortune benefits the family, <laughs> right? So if you have your fortune in order, then the family's in pretty good shape. So be always ready to die. Be in a state where I'm prepared to go out at a moment's notice. Um, and my fortune is in such a state that it can be transferred over, whatever I've got, what little I've got, to transfer it over to those who are my heirs, my wife and daughter, so that they'll be well taken care of. My family, insofar as 
my connections with them are good and settled. It's not settled as if leaving, but not, not, nothing or very little is left unsaid. No, no unspoken I love yous. And my fame, is, which basically means it's a grandiose way to say that whatever legacy of art or writing or poetry or photography or song, whatever the case may be, whatever it is that I want to do that's my, uh, my avocation, the thing that is my expression of life, my, my barbaric yelp, <laughs> whatever that is, that I've got that out of the way too. So fortune, family, and fame. And for the most part, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty good. On, oh, definitely good on the family. Uh, fame, fine, fine. For the book, Going Alone is published. I have another book, um, No More Looking Out for Number One, that is also now out there. That's the prequel to Going to Going Alone, and I'm working on the third one. But if I died right now, that would be fine. The, the third, the contents of the third book are are summarized in Going Alone, so that's fine. Um, the stuff I'm doing, Stoic poetry, is just an ongoing thing that I'll do. Um, you know, it's just. It's like a daily exercise. So it's good, it's good that there's no end to that, is what I'm saying. So it's okay to end whenever. And then the, um, yeah, that's it. Be always ready to die. Number two is make good and effective use of time. To not take these moments for granted or waste them in some ridiculous way. Pretending that I have forever that a lifetime and then beyond beckons. <laughs> I may not even get a single lifetime. Well, I'll get that, but you know what I mean. I mean, I get the stereotypical hope for a single lifetime. It's hot. I need some water. Number three is the <clears throat> development and maintenance of good and sound life principles. Uh, these are these things I'm talking about right now. That is the good life. These are my objectives and principles that I've developed. So that's the third one is to develop. And then the key word there is maintain. That means I have to reflect on them. That's why every morning um, as the sun comes up on my way to work, I recite all of these things to myself and I think about them. And I, and I ask myself if they're it's a good use of time. Well, I've, I ask myself if they're sound. That's what I'm asking myself. Because maybe I'll learn something more that will reveal that some of my objectives or principles are not sound. And if someone can show me that that's the case, then bless you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Number four is the cultivation of good emotional reactions to react well to the circumstances of life, to be able to um, not fly off the handle or basically lose control when things don't go my way or as I expect or as I wish, or in a way that is comforting, or comfortable, to react well. This is a stoic virtue, to recognize the, what I really control with is my emotional reactions to everything, and my reaction, in fact, to everything, to anything. Most things I can't control, very, or have very little. Next is um, the performance of good actions, to simply do good things throughout the day. You know what that means. Simple things, big things, small things, eh? things of every size in between that make the world a better place. Next is the um, principle of purpose. I don't think the universe has any purpose. The objective of purpose. Wait, hold on. Am I getting my objectives and principles screwed up? Hold on, number one. Be always ready to die. Good and effective use of time. Develop the maintenance of good and sound life principles. Cultivation of good emotional reactions. Performance of good actions. Oh yeah, I had to get them screwed up. The next one is number six. The recognition of true limits and true opportunity. Identify what is within my scope of opportunity. What are the things that I can in fact do? And what, is it? And what are the things I cannot? For example, it is in, within my scope today to turn around after I make this video, explore this valley just a little bit, and then head back. I would like to go to Mount Wildness. That's a little too risky. It 
it may be possible. It's not a good example I'm making, but it's topical. So I have to recognize true limits and true opportunity. I have the opportunity today to explore this valley just a little bit and head back. And I need to do that because it's going to take a long time to get back. The sun is coming. The sun is hot. And then I've got a 200-mile motorcycle ride back to uh, home. That is the prudent thing to do. It would not be prudent to carry on. It would be better to wait until I come back and then have another day to go forward. Yeah. True limits and true opportunity. That wasn't a good example, but I think you get the point. And then the seventh objective, it's the last one, is the objective of um, uh, one thing slowly. More and more of this is coming up all the way on this hike. I was trying to slow my steps and make them more careful and deliberate. One thing slowly. There's a lot of Buddhism wrapped up in that, I think. The measured breath, the mindfulness, things like that. Now, on to the principles. The first principle is the principle of war. I rise every day to go to war with everything I hold true and everything you hold true. Anything you proclaim is true. I want to know if it's true. If you're right, I want to know. But I'm going to ask you to, uh, to show me your work. <laughs> Likewise, I want to uh, verif see my own work and verify that it's actually true. <laughs> so I do that. That's why I do my Bible study every day. Because people keep telling me that it's true, but nobody shows me their work. So I'll, I've endeavored to do the work for them and uh, see if it's true for myself. So far, it doesn't look so good. Two, uh, the principle of reason. And this is the first one that has sub-principles. Sub-principles of honesty, objectivity, and I added a new one, doubt. Reason is the instrument and tool of ascertaining whether... Uh, understanding the world, basically. It's the instrument that we use in that war to find what's true. And we do that, we succeed at that. Reason, of course, has a process. We succeed at that when we're honest with ourselves and when we look at the world objectively and when we enlist doubt to not believe things too soon. That'll come in later when the principle of sin and damnation. So uh, war is the Aim, reason is the instrument. The third principle is the homunculus. A funny word. It's an old word that talks about, means suggests a little man or woman inside our head, you know, running the, the controls. I always like to say, picture that Will Smith movie, Men in Black, with that one alien that was actually a, a robot body, and there's a little alien inside, and they popped open the face, and there's a little man. Imagine that inside your head, running the wheels, steering things, and pushing buttons. And now, I use this idea as a substitution for the concept of a soul, because I don't think we have a soul. I don't think we have a soul, because I have absolutely no good reason to, to believe that. No one can show me any work that uh, indicates that this fancy idea is actually something real. So I use the homunculus to remind myself that... Um, this thing that's my consciousness seems to be an emergent quality of who I am. Kind of the way a wetness emerges from a puddle of water. You get a couple of molecules of water together and at one point they become wet. <laughs> a single molecule of water isn't wet. What is that quality of wetness? Likewise, consciousness. Get enough uh, neurons together doing stuff and eventually there's something called consciousness. I don't think we all... We don't fully understand it, but I have no reason to think that there's anything supernatural about it or that any part of that survives and carries on elsewhere. So I call it the homunculus. The interesting thing is that the homunculus in my perspective is sealed in the container of my brain, in, in, literally in my head. I can't get out. So when I die and this corpse begins to rot away, so too the homunculus suffocates and goes out like a light. God for good. It's my way to remember that uh, I'm here, but I'm not forever. Or at least there's no reason to think so. Next is, um, after the homunculus, is the home of good and evil. I think about this as a reminder that good and evil appear to reside as opinions in our minds. They are born of subjective impressions of what constitutes right and wrong. 
Subjective, yeah. Morality appears to be subjective. At least on the individual perspective. But when we get to, when you and I get together and we agree upon something as being good, then it becomes objective. We can actually, we can actually begin to measure it. For example, we can say that uh, the cleaner the drinking water, the better the, the, the health of the individuals who drink it. So we have an objective measure of, of good and bad. It is, it is better to have cleaner water. Likewise, uh, improved education or better communications or, or uh, equality amongst uh, the races, the sexes, etc. I like to think of good and bad and right and wrong as written in chalk by the homunculus above his head, his or her head, kind of written up there. I like the idea of chalk because that's what I use under the writing bridge uh, in, in Siberia to write these things down because they're not permanent and they'll blow away. <laughs> they're subjective after all. Next, after the home of good and evil is the principle of purpose. If the universe has no objective purpose, if good and bad and right and wrong are not written in the stone or in that sky or in the stars that I saw last night. They're not, the universe isn't swimming in, perp, swimming in morality. Basically, I'm saying if there is no God, to, no lawgiver, there's again, no reason to think so. People tell me they have good reasons, but I'm not, I'm not buying it. They're, they don't seem very good to me. If that's the case, then what is the purpose of life? This is where it's tempting to give up and say, ah, life has no meaning. Nihilism. <laughs> Hashtag nihilism. No. No. I mean, I, 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 know, that, I know that feeling. I know the, the draw to that. I don't understand why someone would kill themselves just because they think life has no meaning. What I've done is, is I simply turn around and say, well, to, to hell with it. I'm going to come up with my own meaning. <laughs> and I st see one purpose that seems to be in the universe that that is there on its own. Excuse me while I sneeze. <clears throat> and that is the purpose of having babies. Biological animals, creatures and plants and all that kind of stuff, we seem to be uh, driven to reproduce ourselves. That seems to be a purpose. It's mandate within us. So, okay, there you go, there's one. But I don't think it's written in the stars. It, it's, well, maybe it is. Maybe it's some consequence of our, these chemical reactions that we are that we're going to reproduce ourselves. Maybe that's the way it works throughout the universe. Maybe life, there could be no life without the, the mandate of reproduction being a part and parcel of, of our existence. I, just on the top of my head, I can't even see how it could be otherwise. Why? How would life perpetuate itself otherwise? Interesting. That may be an objective purpose of the universe. What a curious thing that is. Does that require a God? I don't know. I'm thinking that. I need to think about that. So purpose, one purpose is to have babies and see them to maturity and be around long enough to give them a good start in life. Another purpose that I decided upon, just because I like it, is the purpose of virtue, where virtue is defined as the improvement of the well-being of thinking creatures. Couldn't say well-being of all life, because I mean, what do we do? We wouldn't eat. So something's got to give. But thinking creatures. That's why I'm vegan. I'm trying to live that, live that, live according to that. I like that purpose. But that also means that my purpose in my life is to make the world a better place. That's why I like my job. I work, for, I work for the government, and in particular, I work at a job where I, I literally help make the world a better place. I mean, in tangible, startling ways. And I'm, I'm about, I'm, this might be possible that I might be facing a job change soon. And I would literally would not leave my job for simply a, a, a better salary. Though that would be tempting because my, my job gives me that purpose. But the other job is another government job with another, with a different city. Um, and I might be able to execute the same thing. So I'll be interviewing next week for that. A second interview. They're calling me back for the second time. And uh, I'm going to be inquiring about that. Tell me what, t help me understand if I can be, if I can do good with this work. That's because that's a purpose that I have. Next um, pr pr principle of my life, principle is um, war. 
The prince of war is to wake each morning and go to war with everything. I'm going to get up and step around. Go to war. Ow! Hope, preferably not barefoot. Well, all of this. Well, not all this. I got no issue with you. <laughs> Ouch. You didn't really hurt. I got no issue with this. I do have an issue with what I think is true. Why do I feel like I'm... I, war? Am I covering my... Am I doing myself over again? First principle. Oh yeah, I, do, I am. <laughs> I already talked about this one. War and reason. Principle number six then is... Atomic principle. Oh yeah. That's why I said... So, Something in me was telling me to get up because this is where I always do something. Uh, uh. There's no sand, but there's little grainy rocks. Oh, there's some sand. The atomic principle. Everything is bits and pieces. Molecules, atoms. I mean, even the early Greeks knew that. The atomists. Everything's made of bits and pieces. So too you and me. We're just little bits and pieces. And very soon, this mortal coil will fail. And I will, one way or another, go back to being bits and pieces again. But just not, I'm already bits and pieces, but uh, this constitution will fall, fall apart and be a part of all that again. It's good to remember that. To, to, to borrow a cliche, nothing lasts forever. Atomic principle. Next is the principle of nature, not this nature. Everything has some nature. It's, it's the nature of this rock to have a form and a consti consti constituent chemical composition and to be sedentary. It's not a motive item. And to sit here in the sun, slowly, well, being drawn to the earth by gravity, waiting for chemical weathering and, and uh, to dissolve it away. So too you and I. We all have a particular nature. It's my nature in It's my nature in particular to come out to places like this every couple of weeks to do what I'm doing here and now. What's your nature? Next, and this is a new principle. I don't think I've ever included this before. It's a new principle. The principle of what is this? Spider what? It is. Principle of the pirate ride, Armity. The pirate ride simply suggests that free will is an illusion. Oh, that we have no real say in what we're doing in our lives. Libertarian free will, you know, the idea that, you know, I, shall I have eggs or shall I have pancakes for breakfast? You know, I would. It's becoming increasingly suggestive to me that we're going to choose one or the other and we would have chosen that in any circumstance. We would not have chosen the one we did not choose. That's because I, I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that we are, what we are at this moment, making these decisions and these actions and what we are made of and all the things that have influenced us are, the, are, are a series of a long chain of events that began with the start of the universe leading to just this moment. And it's like a dominoes knocking a, another dominoes, you know, and that's not a good way to do it because dominoes always fall the same way. It's like wind blowing a, a leaf off of a tree. The wind comes from this way, it blows it that way, and it goes off in a course of action that way. And if a wind comes the other way, it blows it that way. Um, the, the leaf will be blown by the wind. Huh, that's a good way to say it. You know, it looks like we have some choice. We're, we're choosing. Our choice is part of the wind. Our choosing is part of the wind. <laughs> now, I can't prove this. I don't know how to prove this because we can't reverse the universe and see someone, watch someone make a choice again and see them make it the same choice over and over and over and over again. We can't do that. So, this is where I actually chastise myself a little bit. Bad Kurt. Bad Kurt. I'm using a little bit of one of my sins of my life, which is faith in believing that this is true. 
I, I hold, it was this weird spider web. I hold it on faith that we have no free will. There. I'm guilty of faith as well. <laughs> Next is um, uh, maturity. Maturity has two sub principles wisdom and fortitude. Maturity is that state that we reach in life when we have enough experience to be able to look at the past, at, what, at how things have gone, and then to execute, use that judgment, or use that experience to make better judgments, better decisions in the future. Again, back to the free will thing. I mean, <laughs> you can see that even though we have the experience, it's the experience that, that, con that triggers us to make us one way or the other, and our, our natural way we are, whether we're willing to utilize that experience, to have the fortitude to do it that does the same. It's a curious thing. Everywhere I turn, I can't escape it. We, we, we're free to make choices, but every choice we make would be the only choice we would have ever made. Interesting. So you and I have, have so maturity is that thing that we gain over time. Fortitude is the thing that helps us to see it through. You have a lot of maturity, but no, if you don't have any fortitude, it doesn't do you much good. Likewise, fortitude, but without maturity, you're just butting your head against the wall over and over, or possibly butting your head against the wall over and over. Next is the social principle. We're social animals. We need one another to survive, and our best ends are social ends. It's good to do things for others. Next is uh, the principle of uh, public speaking. It's just a reminder to myself to when they talk about others who are not there, to try to imagine that they're there so that I, I don't talk about them in a way that I'd be embarrassed to have them here. It's just basically a, a, a way to stop gossiping. Next is the Feast of Ophel. Gosh darn the gash dang! I always stop my foot! Gosh darn it! It's getting all upset. It's, 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 it's stumbling over the universe and then getting mad about it which is understandable, but it does not demonstrate much restraint. Much, it's much better to actually demonstrate some restraint, to learn to control our emotions in such a way that we do not fly off the handle. The reason I call it a feast is that when we get upset, you know, I may have a bad day at work, but I don't show it to my coworkers, but maybe if I come home and take that out on my family, then I'm, it's like, it's like, I, the way I like to describe it, it's like vomiting up my filth. Blah, you know, all right in front of them. The disgusting thing is that others tend to take that seriously. And they're affected by it. And then it, make, it, it impacts their well-being. It's almost as though they gobble up the feast of vomit of my, of my, my upset. And then they go off and that ruins their day or night. And then they go off and spew it off on somebody else. It's a feast that just perpetuates over and over. We pass it along all day long. You know, someone cuts us off on the freeway. You know, God damn it. You know, and, and then that pisses that person. That pisses us off because they cut us off. And then we go home, go to, go to work and we are mean to our coworker. And that pisses them off. And they, they go off and they're mean to their family or whatever. You know, how you see how this works. And this feast just, it's like ripples. It's like an ocean. After a while, the ocean is just all churning with all the upset. So I try not to indulge in that, one, by not giving it out myself, by having the restraint, and two, by not consuming it when others demonstrate it for me. That's the Feast of Wolf. Now I'm on to number 10, or this is 11, temperance. Temperance is the restraint that I was just referring to. And there are three sub-principles, suffering, simplicity, and apathy. Temperance is good when we can have drink less, eat less, don't overwork, don't play too much, don't oversleep, everything, nothing to excess. Simplicity is, is, the, is the key to that. Well, living a simple life is a temperate life. Suffering is also integral because sometimes we suffer when we deny ourselves what we want. And apathy is important because it helps to know the things that we can't control and to be apathetic towards them. Like wow! Like if it, if I like if I misjudge the day, I'm half a day hike from the motorcycle, and it started to rise above 90 degrees or 100, and started to make my way back. I could start to get panicky and upset. That would be understandable. But I could also enlist apathy to realize this is beyond my control. I made a mistake. I, and do instead of panicking, to come up with a suitable plan of action, either to find shade to hide in, or to decide that I can make it and push through, or to push the button on the emergency 
uh, beacon. Apathy. So I can keep my head in spite of the universe, in spite of the things that are outside of my control. I feel like I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Next is, um, oh, this is a new one. I just added this one last week. The principle of distraction. It's not even in the book. More and more I'm convinced that we spend a good deal of our lives distracting ourselves from something. That something is the very next principle. I, I debated in my mind about whether to put this one first or the other one first, the subsequent one. We're distracting ourselves from something. We distract ourselves through all the things of our living. I'm doing it right now by making this video. Even though I came here to not, to not be distracted, I'm doing it nonetheless. We do it through um, all the family, work, play, activity, sleep, everything that we do, gossip, talking, chit-chat, watching, you know, listening to noise, whatever the case may be, we're distracting ourselves from something. What is that something? better question is, what is that nothing? It's that. I don't know if it comes through the camera. I can barely sense it right now. I don't know, my, my, my indifference detector is, is not working so well today. Besides, there's an airplane up there flying through the sky that kind of screws it up. It's the nothing. It's the emptiness of the universe. It's the, well, not that the universe is so much empty, but the indifference of the universe. It's the great indifference of nature that doesn't give a damn whether we live or die. Nature doesn't seem to care. I really think there is no God, and therefore no one looking after us, no one watching for us, no one creating us or guiding us. It's all just us. We're, we're here for explicable, ic explicable, not inexplicable, for explicable so far reasons. We don't fully understand it, but we're getting closer. And there's no God in the picture. So, what's all this stuff back there? It's the indifference of the universe that doesn't give a damn. It's the non-caring. That's what we're distracting ourselves from. Because that's what's waiting for us after life. That's what we were a part of before we were here. Remember the uh, nothing before you were alive? Yeah, neither do I. That's where we're going to be again forever after we're dead. That's a long time. Da, da, blah blah blah. I don't want to hear about it. Okay, <laughs> let's 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 watch some TV. Let's 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 go to work. Let's get a let's get a go to school. Let's gossip. Let's go play pool. Let's have a drink. Woohoo! Go Rams. <laughs> all this stuff, so we don't have to see all that. But that's why I come here. It's coming out to places like this that revealed that to me, and now uh, it's hard for me not to see it. Although today I'm not seeing it. Hmm. It's interesting that. And that covers the next principle, which is called agency and the great indifference. Agency is all of us living things and our artifacts, the things we do. That's why seeing the airplane flame over the sky there kind of spoils the indifference because it reminds us that uh, we're loved <laughs> by humanity, at least. It's got to be the empty, the howling, which I'm close to it right now. Agency and the great indifference. And then the principle before that was um, distraction, the principle of distraction. So we're getting close. Now, the next one is the principle of the best seat in the house. To not want to be anyone else. To want to, want to be anywhere else. Let's move. I want to go barefoot. This is going to be tough. The principle of the best seat in the house. To not want to be anyone else be anywhere else, be doing anything else, but to be okay with 
just who I am. Whoa, look at that. See this little cactus? That wouldn't be good to step on that. Oh, this is a risk. <laughs> but to be okay with just who I am, where I am, and what I'm doing right now. Well, to expect nothing more. Well, all the while striving to improve. It's a tricky uh, balancing act, that. The best seat in the house. It's not really a balancing act as much as it is simply an acceptance. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a very, very powerful principle, actually, when... Wow! An instantiated! The next principle is the principle of ouch. Not that. <laughs> Not the principle of ouch. The principle of the path of wildness, which is the very first principle I ever came up with. I came up with this in Japan so many years back. The principle of wildness is a way to get unstuck in life. We've got a decision to make. We don't know what to do. So what I recommend is to uh, begin collecting facts. Ow, 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 sand, yes. <sighs> begin collecting facts. And then begin, um, let's go forward. Assembling those facts into a plan, into a, into basically Information that can be used to make give an informed decision to create make an informed decision And then give ourselves some time a reasonable amount of time Especially given any necessary dates that might come up Give ourselves some time to think about it and then when the appointed time comes to either to make a decision and If we don't have enough information that we can afford to give ourselves more time then do so if uh, if not if it's uh, time to make the decision we still don't have enough facts, then, but we got to make a decision. Maybe sometimes it's just better to do that. Then lean on our gut. Listen to what our gut says. It's okay sometimes to listen to our gut. Maybe nudging us to the right or the left. It doesn't mean it's right, but it may be a way to break the inertia and start moving. That's the path of wildness. And I used to do this in Japan, trying to decide which way to go in the wilderness, and I really wasn't sure. And I would just kind of rely on my gut instinct. Eh, eh, maybe that way. <laughs> you know, well, collecting facts like the sound of a waterfall ahead or something like that. It didn't always work, but it usually did. I'm faced with that right now with this job. You know, I'm going back for the second interview, which is a good sign. Um, and if I get offered that job, then I'll have to make a big decision that will uproot my family again, at least my wife and I. And... Uh, I'm exercising the path of wildness process right now, collecting the facts, giving myself a date to make a decision, and then, uh, you know, weighing in with my gut. So, maybe I'm uh, eating my own dog food then. The next, oh, here's some nice stoic walking, barefoot in the Next is uh, the principle of... The risk of avoiding risk kind of relates back to the uh, what I'm doing right now and this decision I've got to make. There's two levels of risk in life. The surface level risks are the things that um, we need to be safe and secure. Education, family, career, savings, things like that. Every good parent's going to advise their kid to pursue those things. But there's also a deeper risk. And that's the risk of not attending to those other things, the things that hippies talked about. You know, our sense of purpose in life and our sense of adventure and thrill and, 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 and doing something that is worthwhile and meaningful and, you know, is our, is our expression back to our, the, the fame, the art thing of life. Snake track, maybe? So all I'm saying is that uh, 
well, attending to the first, the deep surface level risks of education and career and partnership and family, you know, partner with, you know, someone to spend your life with and family and all that security. Watch out, you don't, <clears throat> oh, we don't attend to those deeper level things. That's exactly what I'm attending to right now when I come out and do this. This is the deeper level risk that I know that if I don't do this, I'm desperately going to regret it. <laughs> and I don't regret it. <laughs> This is how the wind has been blowing this stick back and forth. That's the risk of avoiding rest. The next is, and I'm just, I'm again, then closing in on the end. The next is, yeah, I've walked quite a ways. The next is, um, sin and damnation. There are five sins in my worldview. They're all the same thing. Falsity. Credulity. Faith, superstition, and dogma. They're all basically forms of you know, willingness to believe things that aren't true. Falsity is that very thing, the willingness to believe what isn't true. Credulity. Falsity is, is the very things that aren't true. Falsity, the things that are not true. Credulity, a willingness to believe things that are not true. Faith. The calling of such activity, virtue. <laughs> what, what nonsense. Faith, evidence of things unseen. Things unseen are things unseen. It's simply uh, imposing willful, willful thinking upon emptiness. And the funny thing is that we call that a virtue. How in the world did that ever happen? Faith is not a virtue, it's a sin in my worldview. Goodness gracious. Superstition. <laughs> the overt belief in things that are thrilling, but uh, probably not true. In fact, we, we so lump them into that category of superstition because we rather know that they're probably not true. And dogma. Dogma is... Willingness to believe just because someone in authority says so, or tradition says so. Well, that is just copping out. Come on, grow a pair. Sin and damnation, falsity, credulity, faith, superstition, and dogma. The consequence of this is damnation. Damnation not in some afterlife. Damnation not tomorrow, but today, right now. Living and believing things that uh, may not be true even if they're comforting. How much better to live without the comfort, but at least with the uh, quest of continuing to search. Next is um, sin and damnation. Next is uh, complete oblivion. After this life is done, pretty sure that there's nothing for us after that. It's, it's oblivion. We're gone forever. There'll be no reunion with the ones that we left behind? No reconciliation with anyone we left on bad terms with? Or who left first? <laughs> who left us on bad terms? And no final justice. It appears there's no, there's no final court. So seek after the reunion here. Try to reconcile with those we're on bad terms with now and uh, seek justice through the means that we have available to us in the here and now. Next, almost done, the great life adventure. <laughs> great life adventure is one or more, or maybe lots, of things like, things that make you go, wow. Things that make life beautiful and special. Beyond, there's a rock cairn up there, by gosh, on top of that thing. Beyond the uh, simple things, of, beyond just the day-to-day, -day, you know. No. And I recommend giving yourself the whole life, the whole decade of your 20s, your whole life if you could, but you gotta, you got to blend in some uh, hard work in there too. The whole decade of your 20s to uh, the adventures. Go to school, go live abroad, fall in love, experiment, try some different things out, try to make a business, whatever the case may be, and then come back, well, come, come back in your 30s, at the start of your 30s, you know, bleeding, broke, you know, with a grinning ear to ear, suntan, you know, 
just you know full of stories and then there's plenty of time to begin settling down you'll be behind you'll be five or maybe even ten years behind your your peers who went out and started their safe and sane earlier but um, I trust me there'll be some great value in that even if you never catch up even if you have to work another five years longer than them um, I, I have a feeling you'll also be one of those most interesting people at the cocktail party for the rest of your life <laughs> Do it just for the sake of not being dull. <laughs> that is a rock cairn up there. Next is, um, oh yeah, season of philosophy. It's the time of life to record what we've learned along the way, especially by virtue of our great life adventure or ventures. And then sharing that. That's what I do with my writing. That's what I do with these videos. This is my season of philosophy. And the season doesn't have to come late. Start started earlier. As soon as the as soon as the words or the images or whatever it is that is your your canvas, your vehicle for your muse, as soon as it starts to speak, get it out there because you'll never get those words again. If you don't speak your words in your twenties, you'll have different words in your thirties. They may not the words in the thirties may be better, but they won't be anything like they were in the twenties. This twenty stuff is worthwhile. Seasonal philosophy. Now just uh, I think it's just three more. I remember doing this with a video in Japan. That one long video where I swam across the river at the end and put the camera down on the sand like this and sat here and talked to you. I remember what that video was. I remember the place. Three more. Next is the bullseye aim. The bullseye aim. No matter, you, you know, okay, when you throw a dart at a dartboard and it doesn't get a a bullseye strike every time. I mean, you're, it's like, ah, shucks, you know, I missed it. But you don't hold it against yourself necessarily, right? It's not, you don't, you know, it's just, ah, that's, you know, you expect it, right? That's the way life, that's the way darts is, right? Even the best dart players aren't hitting bullseyes every time. So why do we expect more of ourselves in life? Why do we expect ourselves to be hitting bullseyes with every throw of the uh, dart? I don't know. Give, give yourself a break. Life isn't all about bullseyes. I thought it was all about throwing the darts. <laughs> so it's so cliche. But I use this every day. Every day. I don't quite make the mark. But I remind myself that's okay. I tried. Sometimes I miss it completely. Yet I tried. Sometimes I hit it square on. Still, I tried. Yeah, I tried. Two more. Next is, um... The uphill climb. Is it Sisyphus? who pushed the boulder up the hill and then rolled down, down. He had to go back down and push it back up and then roll down and push back up. Mm, that's life. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish it wasn't like that. It's because we're fighting against entropy. We're a, an open system here on Earth. So we got all this energy from the sun coming in. So the, uh, you know, entropy is falling. Everything's falling to pieces around us, but we've got to work really hard to put it back together and keep it going, including ourselves, including our missions, the mission we choose in life. So, eh, that's just the way it is. Last one. Arena and utility. Life is an arena for the execution of our objectives and principles. To have a great life adventure to assuage both the surface level and especially the deep level risks of life, and to wage a war instrumented of reason, recognizing that we're falling to pieces, yet pushing uphill, never quite making the mark, yet striving for virtue, for the well-being, the improved well-being of thinking creatures, and then dying and falling away to nothing, gone forever. Never, ever, ever coming back. Except as your atoms, which never went away. But you, are, you and I will be gone for good. And with that upbeat message, I'll say goodbye for now. Thank you for joining me for another good life adventure. Be safe, but um, not too safe.
Give me a palm up, dude. Maybe another miner's rock cairn. Just at the edge of the uh, Valley Dyke. Goodbye. Deep water. Even beyond deep water, actually. Looks like some rocks have been piled atop here. Certainly the case. Any miners can or container of any sort, glass jar, with a mining claim. I don't see any. Nothing around. I guess not. Interesting. I just thought of a, a good use of apathy. I'm far, far from the motorcycle. Many hours of hike, hiking ahead of me. Yet the motorcycle is exposed at Siberia. It's got a little note on it. But there's nothing to keep anybody from loading it onto a trailer or dropping a, a lit match into the gas tank for a bonfire. It's truly vulnerable. Or kicking it over or doing whatever they want with it. I'm sure they could get away with it. And yet, I find myself, even though I, I know I left the bike there with that deliberate fact in my mind, nevertheless, I find myself worrying about the motorcycle. And it's such a silly thing to, such a waste of time, especially in a place like this, where I have so much more worthy thoughts, better thoughts. So I'm going to apply apathy to that, apathy to the bike. Apathy, that recognition of the things that are outside of our control. Sure, I could have, that's a nice bit, wow, of a hematite, big piece. Sure, I could um, <laughs> mitigate that risk or avoid, or avoid that risk actually by not coming out here at all. But. I get so much by virtue of the risk, by virtue of the pursuit of that, in spite of that fact. And I get all this. I had a great place for a snake to hide. Or a rodent or something. This is such a worthwhile use of my time. It's a good and an effective use of time. It's a, indeed in pursuit of virtue, everything good about this, the great life adventure, the whole lot. So I take a gamble with the bike's well-being, in fact, with my well-being. But even if the bike is gone when I get there, I'll get by. I've got all the important stuff on my back, namely my wallet and my credit card. I can hitchhike out of here and then rent a car in Barstow and off I go. Not a problem. And yet, uh, it always comes back to nag me this uh, feeling, this, this concern, this worry. Such a silly thing. When I, I, I'm gaining so much in the balance, put it in the balance, it's such, such a wonderful thing to gain. That came in there, I'm not so sure about that one over there, maybe. I'm trying to think about the next time I get here. So I'm going to apply my, eat my own dog food and apply apathy to uh, my concern about my bike. I'm not even going to give it another thought for the rest of this journey. I'll do my best. Remember the bull's eye aim. <laughs> Never always perfect. But sometimes it's spot on. You may recall that if you watched the videos before, last night when I was hiking through the desert without a flashlight, I was concerned about snakes and Duly so, let me show you why. I've been following for the last uh, 50 feet or so this enormous snake trail. Look at the size of this thing. I'm just tracing back to the start of it. And what they do is they hunt along these, um, uh, see the, where the water flow comes down? They, they hunt along here uh, to get in near the bushes here looking for rodents and stuff that may be in there. Anyway, here's, here's the... Uh, I can't see very well, but you can see 
the serpentine S pattern here. And it's enormous. You got it compared to my hand. It's, you know, at least an inch and a half across and deep, deep depression. It's a heavy snake. Follow it along. I hope that's coming through on the camera, all right? And it, I was just walking along and noticing it and thinking about it. T tempted to get out the camera and then it just kept on going. And of course, I'm looking forward to see if there's any bushes, you know, to see if it will, because the snake's somewhere. Who knows how long this is? And that happened to me once. I was doing just this thing and I came over to a bush and thought, I wonder if it's in there. And I got a close look and sure enough, it was in there. Rattle or snake rattling that. Maybe these footsteps are my own. Get up here close to my bag. See how they just, they kind of hunting along the edge here. Now this could have been days back. But what I'm struck with is just how, how heavy this snake was, how deep the depression is. A big serpentine S. I I mean, look at that thing. Okay, well, it's somewhere up there. Or back there the other way. I'm going to stop in the shade up there and have a little rest before I cross the wash. Take care. I stumbled upon the, uh, what appeared to be the remains of an old mining camp. Let's see. These stones here are arranged some way. I wonder what that could possibly be. I see stuff like this often in these camps. Arrangements of stones that mean, seem, seem like they mean something, but I don't know what. Some broken glass over here. Sheet glass. You know how long I've been sitting around? Probably quite a while. It doesn't appear to be melted like glass sometimes is out here. I've got bottles that sometimes appear to be melted. Looks like it's been against that rock for quite a while. Nothing else around here. I see something over there. Could be just a gold. Mylar balloon. Let's go get it. I've already collected two so far on this trip. I'm getting close to Siberia. I can hear the train whistle. Listen. One more. So you might be thinking, how, how do you, or why do you think this was a camp of some sort? Why so? How so? Well, the best part I didn't show you yet. First, it's in this little recess here, which is often where I find these camps protected from the flash floods. It's a good spot, protected from the wind, protected from the flood. Probably using a little jalopy or something to come up this wash. Rough going that. But over here by my pack is the uh, most interesting artifact at this place that might be a camp. I should look for the cairn up there. Oh, no. Rock stones. Big piece of metal here. I wonder what that is. Doesn't look like it's maybe part of an automobile. Like the, the very rear end of an automobile, like with lights and stuff there. But what's this? Oh, like an automobile that had this can handle on it, would it? Maybe it would. Can you see in there? If there's any stakes in there. I don't know what this is. Anyway, something was going on here. More glass and maybe some more rock piles over there. Curious. Well, I'm in the home stretch now. Almost back. Oh look, more metal. Oh, it's buried well under. That's that's hard buried. So something was going on here in the can. Hmm, the mystery of deep ends. Oh, more wood over here. Look at this. More. There's a lid. Oh, another can. Another can. Milk can, I think. Who knows? Okay, fine enough. 
can see Siberia again. Well, at least I can see the railroad. I can see a train passing Siberia. It's a good thing. Slightly different route that I took this time. I came further down the Siberia Wash before making my right turn. A little bit of anxiety right now. Worried about the bike. I was imagine it'll come around the corner and they'll, again, like this it did actually happen once. I see a car parked next to the bike and people fiddling with it. <laughs> the last time I did that it was the, that happened. It was the police. And it was about the same distance away. I could just make out, hey, is that a car parked next to the bike? People walking around? That set the seeds for a bit of anxiety then. I can see the ruins. I don't see the bike. It's still too far. I hear a fighter jet. I can't really see the camera what the camera sees, but I think I'm pointing in the general direction. Probably got another half hour to go. 40 minutes maybe. Turn the camera when I get back. Unless there's something interesting on the way. All right, this bridge under over route uh, under over under Route 66 plays a part of my book going alone. This is the bridge where I found the uh, book by the man that was written in Japanese. Maybe this is it right here. Did it get blown out? It sure did. So it's not used to the end of the bridge. I guess there was a strong enough wind to blow it away. Just riding on the back. It says. This, there's, there were like two books. There's writing on it that talks about, it says, I will return to Jeffrey Candle. I didn't write it. I will return to, I will return to home alive. It's been like two years since I've been out here. I hope we got way out here. Let's put it back under the bridge. Whew. It was over here before. Must have been a heck of a wind. This book was. There was another book here too. There, no? Put it right there. Seen it. Nope. I'm tired. Tough fight. Guess the other book went down. Well, I'm on top of this. Keep it from blowing away. Where's that spider? I don't want it. I don't want to disturb the spider's home. How about it? Here's a good one. The spider's using this one. Using this one. Hmm. I wonder where there's a book one. This one doesn't have the writing on it. Anyway. Put it here. Like that. I don't think it's going anywhere now. Okay. A good adventure. All the way up there, and then up there, even further. Now let's go home.